Uh, it's great to be here today. I haven't really done this before. I'd like to say thank you, first of all, to Abby to let me wear her coat so I can wear a microphone. And also, I'm sorry, but I do stick to the stereotype just because English is what I'm passionate about. Um, so I'm going to start by saying, ever since I was a kid, I surrounded myself with books. So I consumed page after page, and I met character after character, and I read whatever I could get my hands on. Um, Mallory Brackman's Noughts and Crosses, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I love the written word, and I've always loved English, because how could I not? I mean, it's the study of the written word. But it wasn't until recently where you engaged in that horrible process of writing your personal statement, um, and I thought about why I loved English. And I realized that I love English because for me, sorry if there are any anthropologists here, um, to study English is to study humanity. And when I was researching for this speech, I found this amazing quote by an American historian called Barbara Touchman. And she said, books are the carriers of civilization. Without books, history is silent, literature dumb, science crippled, thought and speculation at a standstill. Without books, the development of situation would have been impossible. Books are humanity in print. And this is a view I completely subscribe to. I mean, for me, everything meets in literature. For instance, Samuel Pepys's diary, or more famously Anne Frank's, um, bring history alive in a way that merely staring at numbers and facts and dates doesn't. I don't believe there is a clearer, more personal, or more reflective account of what it was like for a Jew in hiding in World War II than Anne Frank's. I don't think anyone can read Anne Frank without crying at some point. Equally, I don't think there is a textbook that can give us all the understanding of the context, of the pressures, of the experience that Anne Franks can. No one's ever cried at a textbook. And this is what literature does. It brings history alive. It breathes the human experience into it. It takes it beyond the oh so fascinating facts and figures and into relevance of everyday life. And history is not the only thing that literature gives voice to, okay? Literature gives voice to science too. A scientific non-fiction book called Silent Spring by Rachel Carson, a woman I'd never heard of before this speech, but I now have great respect for, um, caused such a reaction in the US that it led to legislation banning the use of DDT, which luckily for the US means all their freshwater fish are still alive. And it's the application of science through literature that's led to this. Because literature makes science accessible to the masses. It's books, not scientific papers, full of inaccessible scientific jargon, such as new mono ultra microscopic silico volcano neucaniosis, um, that allow science to flourish in all parts of society. Now, whenever I've spoken to my mathsy friends, they've always said they hate literature, which has always led to such heated discussions that eventually you have to whop out the let's agree to disagree statement. But I finally found a killer argument here, because without literature, the world of maths would actually be pretty sparse. Um, it would lack works such as Euclid's Elements, which is a hugely influential mathematical and geometric work, treatise, or so I'm told, written by an ancient Greek. Literature gave this man's ideas an immortal form. After the invention of the printing press, it's estimated Euclid's Elements was the second most translated, that would be about 76 times, by the way, and published book after the Bible. I think it's fair to say that had Euclid's thinking not been committed to literary form, it could have been lost, and mathematics could have been without geometric algebra, which would have been a tragedy. <laughs> which proves that even in mathematics, an aspect of our society which seems at such opposition to English, literature is intrinsic. But it's not just aspects of society. It's human nature itself and the study of it that literature can give insight to. 
Young once said, poets create from the very depths of the collective unconscious, voicing aloud what others only dream. And maybe it's the existence of Young's collective unconscious that allows us all to empathize and sympathize, see ourselves reflected in books and poems and characters. Maybe it is a recognition of archetypes, the same characters, situations, symbols, again and again, found in Red Riding Hood to Terry Pratchett's The Night Watch. But whatever it is, books allow us to explore parts of ourselves we never knew existed. W.H. Auden recognized this when he said, a real book is not one that we read, but one that reads us. Now, whether we realize this when we sympathize with the atrocious acts of some villain, or we just feel relief in the acknowledgement of a shared experience while we're reading a book, literature continues to depict human nature in all its virtues and flaws. Because books, as Ishmael Reed clarified, can be anything they want to be, from a vaudeville show, the six o'clock news, the mumblings of wild men saddled by demons, but they are all documentations of the human experience. And studying English really is to study humanity. <laughs>